Good morning, everyone. It is the 10 o'clock hour. It is Tuesday, January 28th, 2020. Uh, I will call the um, meeting of the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors to order. The Board of Supervisors of the County of Del Norte and the governing body of all other special assessment and taxing district for which said board so acts is now meeting in regular session. Only those items that indicate a specific time will be heard at the assigned time. All other items may be taken out of sequence to accommodate the public and staff availability. So at this time, Kylie, you want to take roll? Supervisor Howard? Present. Supervisor Cowan? Here. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Here. Chair Hemmingson? Here. And we will now take a moment of reflection. And now if you'll all please stand and join uh, uh, Chris, uh, Supervisor Howard in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Introduction of new employees. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'd like to introduce Brian Strom. He's uh, our newest parks maintenance worker, a uh, longtime resident of Del Norte County. He actually, uh, we call it graduated through the Workforce Center uh, storm damage crew because he did, he worked for us through there for quite a while, proven to himself and uh, We've, we brought him on. Uh, he is actually the sixth person that we have actually hired, either full time or part time temporary through that program. So, great. Brian? Welcome. Welcome. Hey. Thank you guys for giving me a chance to be a part of you. And right on. Glad hope you you're like here. To get your hands dirty. I hope you like to get your hands dirty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any others? New employees? No? No? Okay. At this time, I would request any deletions, corrections, or additions from board members to the agenda. In order to add an item to the agenda, the matter must have come to the attention of the county subsequent to the posting of the agenda, and the matter requires attention, action before the next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Are there any such items? Okay. Seeing none, we are going to receive a uh, Brief reports or announcements uh, for programs, projects, process, uh, progress of two by two committees, goal committees, anything else. Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since our last meeting, Supervisor Cowan and I attended the future facilities meeting where we discussed the possible county jail behavioral health service expansion project. That's quite a mouthful. Total cost of the project is $792,000. However, that will not have any impact on our local county budget. Last week, I attended a meeting of the Del Norte County uh, Crescent City Chamber of Commerce meeting where we discussed the budget, along with getting assignments for the 2020 4th of July events. Also attended the annual 4-H Soup Supper, Supper event and it was a tremendous success. I attended the Del Norte County Chamber of Commerce annual dinner. Many businesses were honored and Debbie Stouffer, uh, owner of Del Norte Office Supply was chosen as business leader of the year. Yesterday I attended a meeting with the CAO where we discussed items that are appearing on today's budget, excuse me, on today's agenda. Uh, yesterday, I attended the Del Norte Local Agency Formation Commission, where we had discussed the fiscal year mid-year budget review, along with the compliance work program. And yesterday, I also attended the Board of Directors meeting of the Redwood Transit, uh, Redwood Coast Transit, Transit Authority, where we accepted the fiscal year 2018-2019 RCTA financial audit. 
This was updated with the RCTA plan for the American uh, Disabilities Act plan, and we adopted a resolution to accept the funds for bus replacement and authorized uh, the general manager to execute the agreements. And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Howard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was a busy last couple of weeks since our last board meeting. Uh, been doing some extensive discussions with the upcoming decisions before the California Fish and Game Commission here in, in uh, this next month of February for tag allocations for the coming year. As many of you are aware, we've been bird dogging this issue as a board for the last uh, four or five years with the increase in elk populations in our backyard. And we had tremendous amount of success last year when the board uh, was able to convince the uh, department and the commission to uh, rewrite the environmental impact report for elk, specifically in the northwest region, which includes not only Delnart but also Humboldt County. In that EIR, they considered tag allocation increases up to 60. Um, that, that has uh, been a benefit. That plan went into effect last year where they allocated out of that 60 just 20 of the tags. This year's proposal going forward will be an additional uh, 40 tags to get up to that maximum number that they uh, allocated in the EIR and that proposal will go before the Fish and Game Commission um, in February 2020 and be acted upon in April and, and at some point here in the near future um, we'll probably have the ability as a board to react to that proposal by the department to the commission and uh, would request that at that time uh, when necessary. Also had a great deal of discussions with the California Department of uh, Parks and Recreation and uh, National Parks recently on some issues that Supervisor Hemmings and I were involved in last year with uh, commercial permits to utilize parks for uh, commercial vendors. In this point, it was impacting guides. Um, the guides uh, were requested to get a commercial use permit for going through the park at a cost of about $200. Um, then they found out while using the park, they'd also have to use, get billed for their day use fees while in there, going in and going out, and they were just picking up and dropping off their vehicle. So it became a, a big issue at this point in time, still working through it through uh, David Romer with National Parks, but trying to figure out if there's a ability just to have one permit that covers the access to our parks so they could uh, bring visitors to our county that are spending quite a bit of money here to enjoy it without having a big impact to their pocketbook. We'll see where that goes. Had continued discussions with Caltrans on issues around Highway 199 and 197 and the litigation that's been present for the last 12 years. And then also had a follow-up meeting with uh, Tamara Layton, who's the director of the Local Transportation Commission, and Supervisor Hemmingson, about some of those discussions with Caltrans the previous week. In addition, attended a first five families commission meeting and the Del Norte RCD meeting, which is the Resource Conservation District. Also attended an oversight board uh, committee meeting where we approved the allocation of payments for our scheduled payments for 2020. Attended a North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District meeting and then also with Supervisor Hemmingson attended the North Coast Resource Partnership meeting in Ukiah where we worked on a grant. Um, the, let me back up there. We, we were awarded a $1 million grant where we'll work on healthy forests and communities planning for our rural counties are participating. This would be uh, Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte, and Trinity counties. And this planning effort, we hope in the next couple of years, will provide uh, a recognition that when you're doing a lot of forest planning around fire hazards and dangers, that it impacts a lot of folks in rural communities. And some of the planning efforts we hope to succeed on will also develop some economic impacts from those planning efforts to where we can develop uh, innovative ways to utilize some of the fuels that could potentially come out of these forested areas. Um, attended the Del Norte Solid Waste Management Authority meeting. Um, had issues still as we were presented by the board last time on SB 1383. It's becoming quite a hurdle especially for suburban and rural communities to have this heavy lift in the next couple of years. Um, I was emailed shortly after the meeting by uh, Director Ward that 
My comments were paid attention to by people at the state level, which was quite interesting. At that meeting, if you recall, I, I mentioned, well, we really need to evaluate how much it's going to cost us to develop the infrastructure around SB 1383 versus paying the fines, because that's a real issue that this county has to answer. Is it cost us less to pay a fine, or does it cost us less to do the infrastructure improvements to implement what we're going to be required to do by 2024? And a lot of times when legislation is developed for the state, it's only thought of as kind of a, a suburban issue or a, or one of these big city issues where they have the infrastructure and they have the funds to do these type of efforts. But in this case, rural oftentimes gets left out and there's no budget to do it with. And as uh, CAO Serena said last time, if the governor really wanted to do this, he would have allocated more than just a $10 million increase into the state's budget to help rural counties input some of these things that are going to be required of them by 2024. Um, attended a city county two by two with Supervisor Cowan on uh, public safety uh, safety polling, which will be on our agenda today, and then a conversation with members of CSAC. As you may recall, I was appointed to the Agricultural Natural Resources Committee of CSAC as their committee vice chair this year, where we're going to be addressing and focusing on a lot of issues around legislation, home hardening, um, cannabis, specifically on combining all the state agencies involved with that right now under one roof. Um, some water bond and policy issues, and then obviously this SB 1383 will also be top of our agenda. And that's all in my report today, Supervisor Hemmingson. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, last week I attended the North Coast Emergency Services Quarterly meeting in Eureka. Uh, that JPA board reviewed our, the new trauma and STEMI. You want to say, well, what, is, what does STEMI mean? They use everything as a language of speaking in acronyms, but that's the State Elevation Approved Myocardial Infarction. And that's the how you deal with strokes, is another word for strokes. Anyway, we are in the process of reviewing those protocols, and uh, that's an in-progress uh, event. Uh, in new business, our board approved plans to implement a, its own stroke care plan, uh, Humboldt County reports that cerebral vascular disease, again, the stroke, continues to be a big problem in Humboldt County, while uh, state and national levels, the mortality rate is actually going down. But in Humboldt County, they are reporting a 80% fatality rate as a result of someone who uh, incurs a stroke, and the average age is 83. So that is something that is kind of... Uh, uh, special to our area where people are uh, suffering from this problem and then unfortunately four out of five are succumbing to it. I don't have any updated information from Del Norte County Sutter Hospital on that, but we'll get back to you. The board also received the Humboldt County Health and Human Services Behavioral Update and in there, emergency medical services and JPAs are reviewing as we speak 5150 hold practices. Now, if those of you are not familiar, 5150 under the State Welfare and Institutions Code is the practice of detaining for a period of up to 72 hours a psychiatric hold for the purposes of protecting the individual from self-harm or to his or herself or possible danger to other individuals. So that's in the process and uh, the authority to place a 5150 individual hold lies with law enforcement a registered nurse or medical doctors. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask our board to invite a representative uh, within the next one or two meetings from North Coast Emergency Medical Services to address our board in explaining the process of this 5150 standardization uh, program. In other business, the JPA is closely monitoring future funding issues with ongoing discussions on EMS funding through the state MADI fund, and this is a fund that funds all of the EMSs, or a substantial amount of it. Um, now, that possibly may be in jeopardy as the state is reviewing uh, MADI funding at this time, so we'll get back to you with more information uh, to the board um, when we meet again on this subject. Uh, last, go, last night's LAFCO meeting, the commission reviewed mid-year budget, no adjustments necessary, the updates um, uh, for the Birch Ocean View CSD, Del Norte County Fairgrounds, and Smith River Cemetery Municipal Services Review and Sphere of Influence are being prepared and delivered 
in the first part of 2020. Additionally, County Service Area 1, the Harbor District, will all be reported, uh, and fairgrounds will all be reported uh, during uh, mid-year 2020. As Supervisor Berkowitz mentioned, we had a Redwood Coast Transit meeting last night, and highlight was the review in, of the past year, and we're looking at additional uh, income derived from advertising and exploring other options to make uh, things easier for folks getting around town. One of the subjects we'll be talking about this year is the State and National Parks Road, which is deteriorating as we speak, and how uh, the Redwood Coast Transit can be helpful in transporting visitors to, up to and through the park rather than taking individual vehicles. We'll be revisiting that again this year. I'm very pleased to report the county parcel on Old Mill Road in Northcrest has been stabilized. Uh, this was a combined effort this past Saturday in the rain and the mud. Volunteers from Home Depot, the Church of Latter-day Saints missionaries, and other selfless volunteers completely cleaned up the parcel, including down the ravine. I don't have an exact total, but it's about three tons of human-created trash was removed. So I want to give a big thank you to Alan Winogradov of the county maintenance uh, and also our code enforcement department and the take a bite out of blight volunteers for a job extremely well done. And that's my report. Thank you, Supervisor Cowan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, after our last meeting, I met with Ron Sandler from Del Norte Ambulance where he introduced me to JD from the company that will be now managing uh, partners with him on the business side of the Del Norte Ambulance attended the Republican Central Committee meeting. Tony Self and I met with True North to follow up on the homeless coalition um, and other areas of homelessness that are being worked on. Uh, we received the report from Housing Tools, the board did last fall, um, and we're, one of the recommendations was that the coalition be put together by the community. So reaching out to community groups uh, and making sure that that's being done attended a workshop on homeless that was put on by a grant that the library board received and they brought in ryan dowd who runs the second largest shelter in illinois homeless shelter um, it was a half day event and it was i don't know if anybody else was able to attend that workshop but it was very informative i met with jessica from the triplicate to go over and discuss all things that are happening in del Norte county as Supervisor Howard mentioned, we had um, a city county two by two discussing public safety. Had conversations as I do every week with Daphne Lambert from Del Norte Mission Possible. Many of you have heard me talk about this over the past year. Um, been working closely with her as she um, works with other people of the community to bring a, a full time homeless shelter, taking the, the um, temporary or emergency shelter as it is and doing um, improvements and bringing the building up to code and getting it ready for full time. Um, since we started working on this just about a year ago, um, we now have mental health services and alcohol and other drug services there twice a week. They're doing meals five days a week. Uh, we have lockers over there. Some of the, well, some of the code violations have or the building improvements have been done and we've been waiting for a while of getting the final last part of it to bring it all up to county standards to be able to um, open it 24 hours and take it from that emergency to the next step and this past week we were able to get all that done or get the um, bids for that to go forward and go to private donors to get the funding uh, so hopefully that'll all be coming to an end in the next six months or, or to a beginning I should say it's been a long year of um, just everybody pulling together to make this happen and it's something we definitely need in this community so really good week this past week um, had a meeting followed up with that on uh, Friday with Mitch Hanna Ellie Popadick from the hospital Heather Snow um, from Health, Health and Human uh, Services to discuss the final things that need to be done over at the shelter and help, getting help from them and then other areas of mental health um, with them. Uh, attended future facilities, uh, excited about that because I sit on the mental health board. So um, being able to uh, bring that part to the jail and be able to have uh, a space for mental health to do their intake and help out is gonna be huge. Um, we worked so hard on the, that uh, stabilization unit that didn't seem to come for, to fruition. So to hear that future facilities and, and it, it's going to go over to the uh, jail, I, I feel is still going to fill that need and pretty much 
capture most of the people we would have um, on the other area. So that was really good to be able to be part of that. Uh, did agenda review, and as Supervisor Howard um, mentioned, I won't go too much into it, but attended our solid waste meeting and the issues that we're facing. Um, all too often, the state of California uh, passes down uh, things to us, policies, procedures that just do not fit Del Norte County. We are not like the rest of the state. And I think that's why it's really important to have the voices up here that you do. That's the reason we w go to the state and uh, federal, is to make sure that they know that we are so unique and so different. And when they pass these laws, it really, really hurts us. And um, so once again, we'll be that voice to let them know what they're trying to do to us it just doesn't work for us. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Vice Chair Cowan for filling in for me on agenda review, as well as future facilities. Uh, for some reason, I had a stack of meetings uh, um, out of town the last couple of weeks. I went to the uh, RCRC meeting in Sacramento uh, the board of directors meeting uh, where we, among other things, our regular business, we had the swearing in of our new officers and an overview of, and an overview of the state budget. Uh, also attended the officers installation banquet. Uh, as Supervisor Howard said, uh, we had a meeting in Ukiah NCRP uh, forestry ad hoc committee uh, dealing with the regional forest and fire capacity program block grant. Um, and, uh, and then I also had in, went to Chico uh, for a NORTEC meeting uh, where we received and approved the second quarter program report uh, and uh, formed an ad hoc committee to evaluate the service providers and make recommendations uh, on their contracts to the full board for approval. Um, among the rest of our, you know, th all those meetings, we have a lot of other uh, normal uh, meeting uh, issues that we deal with. Um, as uh, was stated uh, by Supervisor Howard, we met with uh, local transportation staff uh, on the 199-197 project. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ellen uh, Winogradov uh, and Dominic Mello for the Pacific Shores cleanup uh, that, we, uh, that was just taken care of the last couple of weeks, as well as uh, all the people uh, involved with the old mill road, um, the sheriff uh, along with uh, with uh, the other people that uh, that uh, took care of the old mill road cleanup uh, on county property. Uh, while I was in Sacramento, uh, I met with uh, uh, Senator McGuire's chief of staff, uh, where I had discussions on the UC extension funding, um, and and also funding uh, for modernization and upgrades of the jail, which uh, we are in dire need of and uh, trying to find avenues and ways to uh, make that happen. Uh, along with the jet fuel tax, uh, there's a, there was a fair bill that was passed a couple of years ago, AB 1499, now they have these funds and they're working on ways of distributing those funds and they've got uh, some crazy ideas and some good ideas and we would like to go along with the good ideas. So we're trying to push that a, a little bit. Uh, and that looks like it's about, well, I also had a call with the uh, RCRC staff uh, about uh, UC Cooperative uh, Extension funding. So we're still, still working on that little uh, project. Um, and that's, uh, that's it for me. So we're gonna move on to the uh, consent agenda. Um, I will take- Motion to approve. I have a motion. Second. And a second. Any public comment? on uh, consent agenda items only. Okay, seeing no public comment, then we'll bring it back to the board. Any questions or discussion? Kylie, would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. Okay, so we will move on to Budget transfers. Looking for a motion. A motion to approve budget transfers 0102, 0103, 0104. Second. I have a motion 
And a second, any public comment on these budget transfers? Uh, we have $4,500 uh, in the livestock budget for donations, uh, 159000 uh, for the county services area number one and three hundred and sixty one thousand seven hundred and nine dollar for heat budget to improve and implement the housing emergency aid program any public comment seeing none kylie would you please poll the vote supervisor gitlin yes supervisor berkowitz yes supervisor howard yes supervisor cowan yes chair hemmingson yes okay we're going to move on now to our first timed item which is a 1025 uh uh, comment period members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of this board if you are addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter limit your comments to three minutes is there any public comment Good morning. Good morning. Oops, sorry about that. I'm Norma Williams. I'm chapter president of the Del Norte County Employees Association, SEIU 10 to 1. Del Norte County has allowed infants in the workplace in several departments over the course of 30 years. This family friendly, long standing, frequent practice known to the union and the county has benefited many new parents and their newborns in management and line staff aiding in the bonding process and supporting them because of the severely limited newborn and infant care availability for county employees. Though never formalized, this long-standing frequent practice, especially at DHHS, was recognized by the California Breastfeeding Coalition in 2015 for developing a program for breastfeeding employees that allowed them to keep their infants in the workplace for a period of time. The department was also recognized for delivering family-centered services based on the hopes and needs of their clients, recognizing it requires a work environment that is family-centered and supports the hopes and dreams of employees. The Infinite Work Program is an example of a family-centered support program and is making Del Norte County a great place to work. However, in 2018, your county staff presented the union with a draft visitors at work policy, which completely eliminated the long-standing frequent practice of having infants at work. Union le leadership quickly informed its members and surveyed them twice, once in October 2018 and again in May 2019. In 2018, nearly 75% of the bargaining units wanted to continue the long-standing practice. In May 2019, 93% of DHHS staff voted to continue it as well. The union presented a modified version of the, of the 2015 draft policy on May 9th, 2019. On July 11th, we met again with your staff who requested a more comprehensive proposal. This was sent to them on July 29th and again on August 9th. It was based in part on the state of Washington model. In fact, we sent links to policies in Calusa County, Ventura County, the Yurok Tribe, and the states of Washington, Nevada, Vermont, North Dakota, and Arizona. The union waited four and a half months for a counterproposal. We never received one or even held a meeting to discuss our third proposal. Instead, in November 2019, your CAO summarily declared us either at impasse and suggested that we negotiate terms of ceasing the past practice. In our response, we made it clear that we questioned his assumption of impasse. How can we be at impasse over this issue when the county had yet to supply us with a single counter proposal? We gave you three, count them, three proposals and to date have yet to have a good faith meeting. Infinite work policies are in several states, in Ventura County Public Health, first five counties and in our, our local Yurok tribe. It's proven successful and key to recruitment and retention especially in meeting the needs of the 21st century workforce. Del Norte County's- Thank you, you want to wrap it up, please? I am almost done. Del Norte County's longstanding practice has been very successful over the past 30 years. The question is really whether you're going to support your county employees and their children with the same level of care, dignity, respect, and professionalism as employees care for the community they serve. Thank you, appreciate it. Any other public comment? Seeing no other public comment, we're going to move on. Uh, we'll take up uh, under general government uh, item number 11. 
Point of uh, privilege, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm expecting uh, Commander DP or his designee here any moment. I wonder if we can defer that until uh, the uh, uh, California Highway Patrolman. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. I didn't see you here, my, my mistake, okay. Okay, we're going to uh, discuss and take pop uh, and give possible direction to staff uh, working on an ordinance uh, regarding uh, um, long-term parked vehicles on county right-of-ways. Um, and I'm not sure why we're getting involved with state right-of-ways. I don't, I think that's probably CHP or Caltrans's issue. But um, anyway, Supervisor Gitlin brought this up. Uh, I wasn't sure uh, what the what the goal is here, but uh, I didn't get a board report or anything. But uh, we will... Supervisor Gitlin, give us yeah, some let me explain the local connection to our board and how the Highway Patrol can do its job effectively and how it can address certain issues that are seem to be growing in uh, problematic areas. Uh, California Vehicle Code 22651 is the authority to remove vehicles. If a peace officer is engaged in directing traffic or enforcing parking laws and regulations of a city or a county, or jurisdiction of a state agency, it may remove a vehicle for the, with, under the following conditions. Now, paragraph K is the local uh, component to this, and it reads as follows. If a vehicle is parked or left standing upon a highway for 70, or street for 72 or more consecutive hours in violation of a local authorizing ordinance, a local ordinance authorizing its removal, and we don't have one in Donor County. So recently I met with CHB Commander Larry DP, who is very much in support of this, the county adopting a local ordinance which allows his agency to do its job and enforce state law. I was informed almost all of the 58 counties have such a local ordinance in paragraph K. Donor County does not have a local ordinance. The, this important law gives law, law enforcement the tool to address the rapid growth of vehicles, especially trailers and RVs, who simply pull off to the side of a road of any public highway, right-of-way, or street and create their new home. This wanton, unchecked growth of vehicles, which I will call vehicle villages, has created a health and hygiene issue, is a public nuisance, and poses traffic hazards. I'm certain my colleagues on this board receive no shortage of complaints about long-term illegally parked vehicles throughout the county. Uh, we have received many calls of these violations, but until a local ordinance is passed in support of Vehicle Code 22651, law enforcement has its hands tied and is powerless to act. It's my observation that other communities up and down the state have addressed this issue and I fear the problem will significantly worsen in Del Norte County. So it's my hope we can act on this and introduce a short ordinance uh, satisfying paragraph K of State Vehicle Code 22651. Okay. Um, is there anything you want to come up and say? I, I do have some questions for a CHP officer, um, if you don't mind. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I'm so you cannot enforce within the county on a state highway? You can un enforce illegal parking for more than? Well, there's a there's multitude of uh, parking violations, but this specific section uh, relates to vehicles that are pretty much parked and just left abandoned there. There is an abandoned vehicle um, description in the vehicle code that also allows us to tow cars, but it, it's a completely different parameters and doesn't allow for the same thing that this uh, ordinance would allow for. So in this case, the reason why I, I would assume that um, your agenda has state highways listed, because if the county adopts an ordinance, it's good for the entire county. So okay. the, the spirit of the law is to take vehicles off the road that have just been parked there and intent to, to be left there. It's, it's not to tow cars that, um, you know, someone's parked and families visiting there their homes or, or, you know, or anything like that. I mean, you could, you could just go crazy with right. a multitude of scenarios, but the intent is to take cars that are just left abandoned there, but they don't meet the abandoned uh, vehicle code um, 
requirements. So, so uh, enlighten me just a little bit on the in, uh, the uh, abandoned vehicle code. How, well, how, how the long? The abandoned vehicle code section is is that it has to have major missing components, like you know, no tires, no wheels, no. Oh, windshield. okay, no. I got you. It's, I got you. it's completely different. Okay. And you know, the, a lot of times those are cars that have been stolen and stripped, and they're dumped on the side of the road or or something similar to that. So um, it would be very useful, and, and I think that our entire office would be very supportive of it. And it's, it, its intent is to keep the road safe, just like um, um, Mr. Gitlin had stated. And so it's, it's also a kind of a nuisance problem. And um, I think also our office would be you know, willing to discuss certain issues. And it, it's... Sure. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any anybody else got any questions? I do, and I don't know if mine are so much for uh, the CHP or sheriff. Sorry, my thing's broken. Let me. Okay. Um, so I, I would have concerns because, like at our house, we have five with all the kids. Mm -hmm. There's cars parked there longer than that, and I, you know, I that could become a problem uh, for a lot of people in this community. So that's one thing. The other thing, and I guess this might go more towards the sheriff is I know what happened along Pebble Beach Drive and it seemed, well, I know it helped. Uh, last spring, signs went up because we put up, or the county put up the no camping signs, which was a way of letting the RVs who wanted to park along Pe Pebble Beach Drive to move along. And I feel, um, and I hear from my constituents that that was very helpful. Um, it certainly made a huge impact um, along Pebble this summer. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we already have that ordinance that helped an area that I know personally, um, that it helped, well, I guess I'm, I'm worried about getting into the no, the 72 yeah. hours. So I'm trying to, and I know that what we did in my, uh, what, what happened this summer or last spring seemed to help. So where is that balance? So I, I, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's kind of a different scenario. Like in this case, you mentioned having you know, kids and your, their, their cars parked, you know, in front of your house. That, I mean, that's everywhere. We all experience that. Right. And so um, if a car is being continually moved, um, this would not apply at all. And then also for this to be enforced, there has to be a, a warning placed on the car first. And so if the car has been moved at all within that 72 hours, this section no longer applies. So this isn't intended um, for the vehicles that are parked in front of people's homes. Um, I mean, you could park your car in front of your house and take a vacation for a week and your car is still parked in front of your house. That nowhere, nowhere implies that someone's going to come along there and, and tow your car. That's completely not the intent of this. And then also, there's no way you can make reference to like all the different camping areas or, or parking. This this applies to streets all over the county. So within within residential neighborhoods, within business districts, within the state highways, this is everywhere. So if you have cars that are just left abandoned there right now and they don't meet that um, abandoned section, then we can't we can't really do anything about them. And they, they could just be left parked there. So that, that includes everything from a regular county residential road um, to like an old mill road that you were just referring to with the cleanup that was done and everything out all the way to the state highways with 199 and 197. There's, they, they, they could just be left there. Okay, one more question to follow yeah. up on that. So um, we put this into ordinance. Uh, whose cost is it to um, tow them? So we, for the highway patrol, we have a, a contract rotation list. So if we were gonna tow a car into this authoritative section, we would call our dispatch, they would call one of the tow companies off the rotation and the, the tow expense would be at the owner's expense of the car. So there wouldn't be any expense incurred to the county at all. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Burford. So I see the sheriff there and both of you, and I'm wondering how severe do you think this problem is in Delnor County? Well, I can tell you that multiple times I've heard officers come into the office at the end of their shift and wish the county had an ordinance for this because they've come okay. across cars that there's nothing they can do about. They, they can't tow them, they're left there as junk, and they don't meet that ex ex uh, you know, ex exception yeah. that I was talking about before. This seems like a major problem. We've had RVs on, parked on Iowa and Temple for just weeks and weeks and weeks, and we just can't do anything about it. So you think this ordinance might help solve that problem? I, I do, I think it would help a lot. I also think that um, one of the first things that we do, just so that you're aware of, because it's, it's something that seems routine to us and maybe most people aren't aware of, is the first thing that would happen is if someone called and complained about a car 
and it was parked anywhere near a residence, the first thing we're going to do is try to make contact with, with the residences there. Because a lot of times they can just, those problems can be solved by just asking somebody, hey, we had a complaint you know, about this particular car, would you mind? And, and most of the time people are receptive to that. And either they have some explanation for why the car's there or, or they're willing to, to move the car or do whatever the, you know, the case is. If that uh, doesn't work, and like I said a few minutes ago, you know, we would place a warning on the car first. So. Okay. Thank you. Anybody got anything else? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. I'd like to direct my uh, questions to Sheriff Apperson. Okay, well, what's, do you have any questions? I, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I hadn't met you before, so my, my uh, mistake in not, not recognizing you. It's Crouch. <laughs> Sergeant yes. Crouch, is it? Yes. Okay. Um, can you, so paragraph K, which right now we don't have anything there. It's, it's void. Can you give me an idea across the state of 58 counties, how many counties do not have uh, a, a paragraph K authorizing the Highway Patrol to do its job throughout the county. Is it majority of the counties have such a, an ordinance? Yeah, you know, I, numbers wise, I mean, I, I really couldn't tell you numbers wise, but I can tell you that I've worked from the very southern border all the way to here. I've worked all over the state, and this has been a, a section that I've, I've seen used all over the state. So it's, it's very common. Yeah, Commander DP told me he has worked in 11 jurisdictions, each one in those counties that he's worked in. They all have this o local ordinance. Now, what about uh, when someone planks a trailer down and then lives in it? What about an occupied vehicle in uh, a right-of-way? Yeah, that's a little different. And um, it, this, this section doesn't necessarily apply exactly to that. There's, there's some different things that have to go on there, and, and that's... That, that's a struggle that we face just like you guys do, you know, trying to figure out how to solve some of those problems within the state and county roads. Okay, this, but paragraph K does not address that issue. No, it, no, Perhaps the sheriff not. can might be able to address that. Uh, but your jurisdiction covers all streets, all rights of way, highways in the county. So you can, certainly can look at an abandoned vehicle that way uh, on a on a street, let's say Supervisor Berkowitz mentions Iowa Street or any of the other number of countless areas where vehicles have uh, just planked themselves down and people are living in them on the yeah. street. Yes, that, that's, that's absolutely correct. And, and, you know, to speak to what you're asking about, when I first came into Del Norte County, one of the things I asked was, you know, there's a lot of things that, that are very unique to county courts and, and county roads and county ordinances. And I had specifically asked, is there a county ordinance to have vehicles towed? And I was told no, and that's, that's been quite a while now. But so. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you, Sergeant Crouch. Appreciate all the info. Sheriff. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as many of you know, I worked in Crescent City for the police department for many years before I became sheriff. I don't know how long ago they adopted this in their policy, but they've had it for many years, and I've made many toes uh, under that section as a Crescent City police officer. To me, it's a no-brainer. I, I would really just be echoing what's already been said, but I did want to touch on one challenge that is financially <laughs> concerning, is that although we do ultimately bill the last known registered owner, uh, you know, it's up to them to pay that bill. So a lot of times, you know, when we're towing these vehicles, we may not get that uh, paid, and there's a cost associated with that. Uh, at least initially and sometimes, uh, you know, forever. That said, uh, it's a problem. And um, it, it's a tool that we don't have that's usually at the end of the spectrum. You know, there's, uh, as mentioned by the sergeant, there are several things we do prior to that. All the years I enforced it, never had an issue like you mentioned, where there's vehicles parked out in front of their house by the resident. I didn't experience that because usually those people are really responsive. You can go knock on their door, say, this is an issue, or you know, you put the orange tag on the windshield that sits there for 72 hours. Homeowners and, and folks usually notice that. And again, uh, not to give people that want to manipulate this system uh, uh, an out, but if that vehicle moves, you know, nearly any distance within those 72 hours and that process starts over again. So most people parking their vehicles out on a public street usually don't let them sit on the public street for longer than 72 hours. But in that case, we would make contact with them and, and we have a lot of success doing that. 
what we don't have is that as a tool. I don't know an agency that, that doesn't have that as an ordinance uh, other, other than ours. And just to sort of uh, validate another subject, we would be enforcing that as well in the county. It wouldn't just fall onto CHP. Thank you. Supervisor Howard. Yeah, I, I want to revisit uh, something that um, Supervisor Gitlin brought up and, it, and use a recent example that was sent to us by a local resident in District 4. Um, the, county, the county roads at Pacific Shores where we've had basically vehicles move off of Pebble Beach, reside out there now, that are occupied, are residing out there for a period of time. CHP just basically stated that this ordinance wouldn't impact them. Is that your interpretation also? Uh, I agree with everything the sergeant said, but I think that there are instances where uh, it can be utilized to to circumvent some of those issues. You know, uh, your your recreational vehicle that's a vehicle, you could utilize this under that. You know, if it's a trailer, there's no motor, it's not driving itself sort of a scenario, there's different uh, there's different rules at play, but if somebody's parking a, a small recreational vehicle in places, and typically the campers are associated often with the vehicle that got it there, and in that case, that vehicle would apply to this section if it's not moving. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's really, and I can't overstate this, it's just an additional tool. This isn't going to, uh, you know, dramatically change the way that we do business, but it's going to problem solve a couple issues that we can't currently problem solve. Good. Anything else? Anything else? Thank you, Sheriff. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any public comment? Good morning. Hi. My name is Katie Gavin. I live at 325 Iowa Street. And I'm going to direct all my comments on Dakota Street problem. Um, I have some uh, pictures here and a map for you, and I'd like to pass them out to the board members. Give those to the clerk, if you would. Go ahead, Katie, if you would. Your okay. time is running, All right. so you're going to get um, cut short. They say don't. a picture is worth a thousand words. That's why I brought the picture. Okay, the situation on Dakota Street. There are two to three adults with three dogs living in a small camp trailer, which is not hooked up to any sewer or water. It was brought in by Mr. Nick Tim Timshenko. Mm. We watched as he dumped a couch on Dakota Street, which um, I took a picture of as him dumping the couch. And he towed a junk car in there and left it until code enforcement had to tow it off of Dakota Street. And he, they also put a trailer on there that they pulled out prior. Um, the trailer that I'm speaking about, as you can see, is not even level, as you can see in the picture I provided. It ha I have been told that these people were hired by Mr. Uh, Timoshenko as security guards, uh, and they also help him supposedly clearing his lot. If you look at the map, I have orange where his lot is, an X where the trailer was dumped. And the people are living. He didn't put it on his property. He put it on Dakota Street. Um, his property is only a few feet away from where the trailer stands. This, is taken, this has been taken six months ago. We've been putting up with this, with this property. And um, I hate to see what the next six months is going to bring to us with this problem. Numerous times the residents in the area have had to call the Crescent City Fire Department because there were fires started on Dakota Street by these people, making it hard to breathe. It has become common for us to see fire trucks drive down Iowa Street onto Broad Street. They know where Broad Street is anymore. They used to get confused. Um, these fires are uh, not camp fires. They're not warming fires. They are trash fires. There are large piles of plastic and rubbish that they throw out that they burn. When burning plastic, it released dangerous chemicals such as hydrochloxide acids, sulfur dioxides, dioxins, furans, 
heavy metals as well as particulates. These emissions are known to cause respiratory ailments, stress in human immune systems, and they are potentially carcinogenic. There's been several times that I've called, at least five, where it has affected my breathing to where I've had to call them. I um, have asthma sometimes, and uh, our neighbor, Mrs. King, who is sitting over there, she has a heart problem. She's in her 70s, and we've been putting up with this all this time. Yeah, Katie, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I don't think, uh, as the sheriff stated earlier, this particular item is going to fall under the, the uh, um, illegal parking of a vehicle within a right-of-way. I understand is, that. This is going to be on a piece of property. And, uh, and the sheriff may be able to help you with that and code enforcement, which sounds like you've already gotten in touch we with. We have contacted, but I yeah. want to bring to your attention that these vehicles are, and trailers that these people are living in are causing health issues. This, there's an underlying issue here. Yeah. It's yeah. just not about somebody living that is homeless. Absolutely, yeah, I understand. I understand. And Should air, I go on or do you want? Uh, yeah, I, your, your time's run out. I think, I think we're good. We understand the issue. Um, and maybe if you want to talk to the sheriff, he can maybe give you I've some. tried to have a meeting with the sheriff. It's been six weeks. I haven't heard back from him. Well, he's standing right I there. know. Be a, a great opportunity to get in touch with him. I hate to put him on the spot, but he's pretty stuck right now. So <laughs> okay. It. Thank you so much. All right. Any other public comment? Good morning, board. My name is Greg Bianchi. It's been a while since I've been here at the podium. Uh, congratulations on being uh, the new chairperson there. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I live on Iowa. And there's been many a time and many occasions I've talked to our code enforcement officer, Mr. Dominic, and I've contacted the CHP, and I've contacted or tried to cut. I contacted the sheriff department on several occasions and was told redirect it to the CHP. I know there's a budget, a budget as far as our code enforcement goes, and when it time, comes time to haul away some of these wrecks, I've had them actually strip a vehicle, and I heard it tumbling as they dragged it with chains out into the front part of my yard. And then I had to call other people to come and get this thing. It took them three days to get it. Then there's an occupancy process. They park these uh, trailers or RVs in our op right on Iowa. In fact, Mr. Berkowitz, I believe, has driven by and seen them. No license plate, no nothing, but it was abandoned for almost a month and trying to get someone to come and take a look at it or remove it. And then all of a sudden, a homeless person moved into it. Then there was another issue. We no longer have the authorization to move that vehicle because it's now being lived in. Well, if he's not in it 24-7, Maybe you can move it when he's not occupying it. So there's the ordinance again. you got a gray area. You can move it when the occupancy is not available. And then who approaches this individual and asks them if they have rights to that vehicle or to that home? As, are they using it for a home or just kind of a way place, kind of place to hang out while they're doing or conducting other business in town? So my thing is this little ordinance doesn't sound like a whole hell of a lot, but I think it's a step in the right direction. I hope you all sit down and think about this hard enough. So let's start with this one. Sometimes we have to take baby steps to get to the full measure. So take this in consideration, get this thing passed. Let's start there and then work on other institutions to get other things implemented that might help us as residents of this county and taxpayers of this county Where's our rights when it comes to us and our speaking? When we shout out, our supervisors need to take and address those issues, not be redirected by them to other sources. That's my major complaint. You as the board, you have our constituents, you take care of people in your districts. If they come to you with a complaint, it's up to you to take action, not to turn around and say, well, go talk to the police or go talk to the sheriff or go talk to the a forestry agency or something like that. So those are my uh, thoughts and those are my feelings. And I've had this being here for five years happen at least twice a month. I almost have, if I may have about 10 more seconds. Uh, I almost created a dialogue with the people doing this so that I could tell them, call me 
or call the Dominic and tell him you got a wreck you're going to be depositing in front of my house so he can come over and take care of it before it becomes an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good morning. My name morning. is Jeff Reed. I live at 300 Kelly Road. I appreciate the discussion you all are trying to have today. And also importantly, I appreciate all the work that the county and the state has done out at Pacific Shores, which is my primary uh, point of interest this morning. My wife and I spend a lot of time out there, two or three days a week, hunting, fishing, hiking, running our dogs, paddling, whatever. It's a very underutilized, locally anyway, a resource for this county. Uh, unfortunately, the cleanup efforts of two or three years ago have gone by the wayside out there due to the increase of people camping out there. Um, legal, illegal, to me it almost doesn't matter. They're leaving a mess. And it's the mess that they leave that to me is illegal. And I'd like to support your effort uh, to use whatever vehicle codes are out there to help enforce those laws. But I'd also like to push you a little bit to consider what other land management agencies have done at the federal and state level. And it costs money, it costs, it takes effort to develop regulations, but most major land management agencies, and the county is one of those, have developed ordinances regarding dispersed camping. And dispersed camping is non-regulated uniform uh, camping it allows people to go out in the woods, go out to Pacific Shores, go to the Forest Service, go to the state parks, and camp where it is, where it is permitted there. And some of the regulations that are involved in dispersed, managing dispersed camping are right up the alley of what Del Norte County needs in my book. One is there are time limits. Some places it's a week, some places it's two weeks, some places it's three days. There are limits on how many vehicles can camp together. Generally it's two. Two is not a party. When you get four people camping in the same place, bad things generally happen. The other, the other regulations that are um, included in that effort are distance from bodies of water. It's a pollution issue, it's a habitat issue, it's a lot of issues. But these are things that are measurable and enforceable given that there's will, and the will takes money, I get that. But there's a road you could start down, as the previous speaker said, two or three baby steps to get us somewhere where we have regulated dispersed camping allowed in Del Norte County, but there are rules around it. And also included in the dispersed camping um, regulations are considerations for human waste. I've sent you all pictures of what I've seen out at Pacific Shores and elsewhere. I have hundreds of them. Uh, a couple months back, I sent out some pictures of some human waste that my wife and I buried because when you do dispersed camping, that's what you do with human waste. The regulations that state that. You take care of your own mess. Your neighbors don't have to do it. The county doesn't have to do it. Um, again, do some research into dispersed camping. The national forests, the national parks, all the land agencies, BLM, they have rules and regulations that are enforceable once they're created. Thank you. The sheriff has lots of work. Everyone has lots of work, but please, Think about that. It's a path we can go down and have some success, I think. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. So I'm guessing we have consensus from the board to give direction to staff to work on an ordinance to fulfill the needs of the vehicle code. And I am interested in this dispersed camping thing. So, Jay, maybe you could you could get bring something back to us at the either the next meeting and we'll put that on the agenda that we can discuss that also thank you for bringing that up okay so we're going to move on i'm sorry barbara for keeping you so long um, was not aware that was going to take that length of time um, we're going to have our 1035 uh, item for the Treasurer Tax Collector's Report. First of all, thank you for approving my investment authority for another year. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure. Okay. 
So this is uh, my treasurer's report, Barbara Lopez, Del Mar County Treasurer, for quarter ending December 31st, 2019. I'd like to say that we ended the year with a bang, as you will see. Um, we, our portfolio ended at $58,548,658. As you can see, our local liquid account, um, LAIF, is pretty substantial at $26 million and some change. And I'll explain that a little bit as we move on. Um, CDs are 18% of the portfolio at a little over $10 million. And our government agencies are about 30% of the portfolio at right around $18 million. Mitigation funds, um, the same, it hasn't changed at $2.6 million. And we have a little bit left in Caltrust, which is the general fund Caltrust at $500,000. Okay, so for October, we had the um, school district series E bond fund, and that was about $5 million. They're gonna probably be using that in the next few years, so I don't think I'm gonna do much with that. Um, LAIF is a good option. It's still earning a pretty good amount, so I don't see any reason to go out and look for a five-year bond for that. Um, again, LAIF is earning good, so I'm gonna keep looking at CDs and five-year bonds, but, um, Knowing that life is still good, I, I might just keep leaving some more in there until we absolutely need um, to invest in it. Um, and I do want to be a little conservative. We have some excess cash flow, and I don't want to overspend. So as much as I would like to purchase bonds and CDs, I think I might try to stay a little bit conservative with that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold today. All righty, so our interest earnings were great, um, $222,000, which is um, amazing. We're gonna see actually just kind of a little sneak peek for next quarter. Um, our LAIF earnings were substantial, so we'll see a, a pretty good um, first quarter 2020 interest earnings too, which I'll be happy to report. And um, interest rates are pretty similar to last quarter. LAIF's at 2.04%. Um, Caltrust is kind of coming down at 1.7%, and the four and five year CDs are still right at one and three quarters to 2% for that as well as the agencies. Um, I don't really anticipate that changing, so when I see something good with a long term call protection or bullet, then I'll, I'll pick those up. Um, a lot more investment activity than we've had in the last few quarters. Um, we did have a couple of things call, which I'm not surprised about. I've been kind of anticipating that. Um, and then we did have some maturities this quarter. So I was able to flip those. I feel pretty good about what I was able to do with those um, items that matured and that were called. And then I was able to pick up a few other things, um, you know, trying to keep things as close to 2% as possible and all in that five year, four and a half year bullet range. And that's kind of my goal moving forward as well. So cash flow, this is what's kind of crazy. <laughs> we had, obviously, October was our um, school bond. That's where that cash flow came into play. December's very large. Um, the main thing I can attribute to that is um, we did have some expenses that weren't realized. They're going to come out this um, probably in January. And then um, I'm we had we had quite a bit of taxes this year. Our, I don't know if we just had people paying earlier, but we're about six hundred and fifty thousand more than we were last year. So I'll take a look at that and see if April's going to be less, or if we just are finally realizing some of that tax revenue um, coming in. But I do anticipate, you know, January is really low. That's actually probably it's probably going to be more closer to a negative five million. So I. It's exciting to see coming in December, but I do know it's gonna be spent. So I'm um, just kind of managing it, but we do have definitely some excess in life. So I'm gonna work on trying to get, you know, some of that reinvested and keep the dialogue with the schools going and anyone else who'd like to chat about it. So that's all I got for today. Barbara, any thank questions? you so much. Appreciate your reports. They're always very informative. Has anybody got any questions? <coughs> Supervisor Howard. Yeah, the, sure. yeah that, that potential bump more than you were expecting yeah i know that hit me quite well and maybe it's mm -hmm. the uh the fact that the assessor is finally catching up with some of those latent property tax pieces that have been mm -hmm. on the books for a while and yeah. now are finally getting billed uh, yeah for the last three years it hadn't been taken into yeah. account i think so so hopefully that continues for the next three years or so we'll start seeing some of that income realized for sure it's a lot of work though she's a very busy lady <laughs> 
Yeah, I kind of want to echo what uh, Supervisor Howard mentioned about that. I think there were 900 properties that were reassessed northward, um, and the assessor is working on more. Mm -hmm. So can you quantify the dollars again, so I heard that correctly, how much more uh, revenue you've developed since I'm attributing this to the uh, reassessments uh, well, I, rather I, than just the normal 2% gain. Yeah, I'd hate to say that it's all from those Prop 8 reassessments or new sales and new, you know, evaluations. Um, it could just be that taxpayers wanted to pay their entire year um, in full. We were very busy this whole quarter. We were extremely busy. I feel like our doors were a lot busier than they have been in the past. Um, it's about 650000 when I looked at the different, um, you know, ranges of income that we got over. And that's, that's for the quarter. So it's definitely something we're going to look at again. And I know our tax roll did go up this year. So it's, I think it's going to, we're going to see that again and again. Definitely. The market's increasing and we're going to finally get to where we need to be. So. Anything All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move on to item number 12. Jay? Um, thank you. I, I placed this on the agenda. Um, I've had some discussions with the city of Crescent City um, representing the city fire department as well as uh, to some extent Crescent Fire and Rescue and I think everybody's familiar with what was in the uh, newspaper not too long ago about them doing a master plan and then considering revenue sources in the future um, they do have some issues coming up in regards to assessments on the within the district and then just the need to address uh, changes in how they've um, addressed their own calls and call volume. And during those discussions, uh, Mr. Weir and I had talked previously about uh, discussions that we've had at, at our level at the county along with our Sheriff Employees Association regarding um, the need to look at other revenue sources to be able to deal with changes that have come down from the state, whether it be the jail, whether it be ordinances that put a burden on uh, rural agencies, uh, some of those planned and not planned. Uh, and we can get into a lot of those details at some other time. But I put this on because the city and Crescent Fire and Rescue are going through a process where They've contracted uh, with Plan West and subcontracted with Godby Research to pull the public in regards to what their needs are and what their wants are from the uh, side of public safety. And public safety, in their case, theirs was fire. And for ours, it's a little bit more expansive. And it's um, gotten to a point now where there is an option or a possibility where we could enter into an agreement with the city um, to t take on some of the polling costs and find out what the public really feels about the possibility of additional fees or taxes. Um, it's, I think, an opportune time to do that because they are going through this process and it would be a proportional amount for each uh, entity. It may or may not work out timing wise because this was a bit of a, a tight time crunch when they came forward and we started to talk just in the last month because they were already under a timeline once they got their master plan done. So what I'm asking today is to discuss this issue and direct staff regarding the use of a contractor to poll or survey and this one would be the, the uh, subcontractor that's already with the city and to authorize staff to contract for services, that would give me the uh, opportunity to do that. Now, I can enter into a professional services contract uh, up to $40,000 without board approval, but this is one of those issues where I believe the board should have this discussion, and uh, I, I know that it's one of the issues that's very sensitive when you go out to the public, but these are questions that the public need to answer so you can give them a better representation as you go forward too. 
Um, I know that in previous discussions with our Sheriff Employees Association, there was some interest in this. And I know we have some gentlemen in the back that may speak to that. It would be a, um, obviously imperative that they're supportive of going forward with any type of public safety. And then we also have to define what public safety is because as you know, in Del Norte County, we arrest them, uh, we charge them, we prosecute them, we defend them, we put them in jail sometimes, and then when they get out, we, um, they're the responsibility of probation. And we hopefully get them back to a position where they don't reoffend. But it's a lot of different items. And then you also have the possibility of public nuisance and even roads as part of public safety. So as we go through this, I, this is really giving me the opportunity to have further discussions with the city to see if we can get to an agreement that I can bring back to the board. And it is under a, a very tight timeline. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Comments from board members or questions for Jay? Uh, Jay, is there a cost that you can quantify at this time on what a survey would cost? I think it's necessary. I'd just like to know because it didn't indicate that in our board report. There is not a uh, set cost yet. We have to come up with a proportional amount. The total amount that the city is contracted for right now is $28,000. If we go on a proportional amount for the number of people that would be surveyed in the county overall, because remember the cities is for the city and the Crescent Fire Protection District, we would expand that out into the county. Roughly we're looking at probably two thirds of that cost being the counties. Do you anticipate the funding coming from the contingency fund or do we have general funds to cover this? There's likely two options on this one. I would like to address it through the contingency fund because that is a fund that's basically set up for um, unknown expenses or emergencies that would require a four fifths um, tra uh, transfer from the board and it's four fifths vote. There may be another option in one of the lines in administration to pull some of this out once I know what that final amount is. But if the board is favorable to this, I would come back with the budget transfer. Mr. Chairman, is there a, an action of motion needed on yeah, this? Yeah, I, I think since direction? we're going to authorize staff to uh, contract for services, that I think we need a motion. Well, I'll make that motion. <clears throat> and looking at, um, we've done one, and the second part of that is direct staff regarding the use of a contractor. And I guess we have a contractor in line, uh, Jay, and that would be Plan West? The, the idea would be Godby Research, who oh, is God. a sub to Plan West. Okay. If we can get this all to, uh, worked out. There are some issues in there that could affect the city negatively in the sense of their timeline. And we have to be sensitive to that. Obviously, they're partnering with us and it's a good faith situation. Another example of working closely with the city in order to accomplish what's best for the overall community. All right, so my motion would be two part uh, regarding we, the use of directing staff to use the contractor to poll or survey the public regarding revenue research related to public safety issues in Del Norte County and authorized staff to contract for services related to public polling as requested by your office. Let's second that motion. Mr. I have Chairman. a motion and a second. Public comment. Good morning. I'm Gene McManus. Um, I'm a long-term member of the Donor County uh, Sheriff's Department. I'm currently the member at large for the DNCSEA. We would be in, in heartfelt support of any type of measure to help us do our job better. Um, <clears throat> to kind of summarize some of the problems that we have right now, within the department, um, we aggressively recruit new deputies. Um, and as we recruit them, if we hire them, then we go through a background process. And then after that background process, then we go through a field training program. It takes roughly a year to get a deputy up and running so he can go out on patrol by himself. Within that year, he earns his California Post uh, basic certificate, which allows him, it's a state certification that allows him to pretty much go anywhere and be a cop. And 
this is where we're running into the problems of being able to compete. California, uh, we, we meet every, the Delaware County Sheriff's Department meets every single training standards and in many ways we go above the training standards for the state of California, specifically as required by post. And as such, California is pretty much the leader in the nation for standards in, in peace officer conduct and how we perform our job. If you look at it from national level, we are supplying absolutely the best professional training that we can for Del Norte County. The problem is, is when we get these deputies to this point, they have to make a decision of what they're gonna do and how much they're earning. And usually we learn them, uh, we lose them, excuse me. We lose them because we can't compete with those even nearby agencies. And I've got a couple of examples here for you. Last year we lost three deputies to Brookings Police Department. Brookings Police Department, they started there um, immediately at $6 an hour more than what they made for us. That works out to roughly $1,000 a month, maybe a little more. We lost two deputies to Kings County. Those were both senior deputies. Those were uh, deputies that we had that had five or more years on. We lost um, two deputies to Shasta County. Those were both senior deputies. We lost one sergeant to the Crescent City Police Department and we lost one sergeant to the district attorney's office. And we're having a hard time holding on to these guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of sensing consensus that we're gonna go along with this. So I, <laughs> okay. I, I, and your time has run out. So All I right. appreciate everything you said. And uh, we certainly support you uh, in your efforts. Um, but uh, I'm kind of sensing that we're gonna move in that direction. So All right. I'm gonna see if there's any other public comment and we'll move on. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for your time. You bet, appreciate it. Any other public comment, Sheriff? Yes. I'll, uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, Sergeant McManus did a great job explaining that. One thing I do want to mention is sort of a cautionary tale as we tend to look towards our neighbors to the south in Humboldt County, uh, and I believe Measure Z. Um, they navigated their way through that process, their Sheriff's Office, still has a critical staffing issue. So as we move forward and we look at solutions, I don't want us to get lost in the idea that we need to create more jobs or buy more equipment or supply more apparatus associated to what we're doing. We have to stabilize the positions that we have. It's one of the most painful parts of my job is writing a letter of recommendation to a chief or a sheriff outside of my jurisdiction and handing them over somebody that we've spent a lot of time and effort and energy and resources into training up. We are, uh, we can't compete with the people in our county, much less outside of our county. And, and that's the challenge. So as we move forward, I just wanna, I wanna narrow that scope a little bit if I can. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Any other public comment? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joni Forscht. I live in Smith River. I'm a retired deputy sheriff for the sheriff's department here in Delmar County. Um, retired from Pelican Bay State Prison also. I have six children that I've raised, I think, pretty successfully. And I still, I'm still one of the administrators for the Smith River uh, <laughs> Sorry, I lose my train of thought when I'm talking in front of people and I don't like that. But anyway, um, the uh, neighborhood watch. So anyway, I'm here to tell you that I am in full support of Measure Z and I know a lot of other people that are too. The one thing that people don't understand is when you say tax and you're going to be taxed again, they don't like that. This is 
a half cent tax, sales tax, and it would pay for maintaining and enhancing our services. Let me give you an example, and I'm taking this from Humboldt County. This is incredible. It enhances the Sheriff's Department, City PD, EMS, you know what EMS is, the DA, probation, uh, emergency preparedness, gives money to emergency preparedness, local radio, which they need desperately in times of emergency situations, um, Department of Health and Human Services, and other departments, APS, that's an important one now here, um, school resource officer, they recently hired a school resource officer, another one, ambulance, fire districts, safety enhancement teams, that's CSET in Humboldt County, homeless outreach, which is something that we've been discussing for how long now, and they have two people that they have just recently hired for that, and they oversee that program, uh, Boys and Girls Club and the Roads Department. So all of these things have come to light and they're getting money for all of this through Measure Z and the taxpayers are the ones that we all will pay for this. So what I'm saying here is we need to reach out to the public. We need to reach out to the people here in this community because the people in this community are the ones that count. They're the ones that need to vote. They're the ones who will have the say. Give them the say. Don't bicker, don't fight with the city, please. Just do it. We need it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Seeing no other public comment, uh, we have uh, we have a motion uh, and a second. Any further discussion from board members? Mr. Berkowitz. Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, I've been involved in polling, I think, for about the last 30 years in this county, and I'm hoping that um, the proponents of the, uh, of the polling will basically establish some kind of group, an outside group, that can help you, maybe friends of law enforcement or some other kind of group that can move this along with the general public. Because if it's just left to law enforcement, I don't think you could be successful. So reach out to other groups or even form your own group uh, to be able to make this measure successful. That's my comment. Thank you. Anything else? Kylie, would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. Uh, Chair, one yes. last thing, just, just for clarification's sake, um, I, because sometimes as we have these discussions and people see this online, they get a bit confused over what the action of the board was. Right. I want to just reiterate that this is not the board passing a tax today. What right. this is is reaching out to the public for the public to give that information back to the contractor as to what the public might support. And I wanted to clarify that and then... Um, also, you know, if, if we cannot work this out to meet the city's needs also, we'll be back to the board to discuss this again in a different direction we might go in. It doesn't mean we won't do it, but it may, may have to be timed correctly to get the information that we need from the public um, so that we don't confuse people overall. Right. And um, I know we've mentioned Measure Z down in Humboldt County, and we have talked to Humboldt County in the past with the Sheriff Employees Association and to see what the pros and cons have been with them once they had it passed um, and no allocation of funds happens obviously until the, the number one there's a vote on an initiative and we've had the, we have that agreement with the city on on separating the revenue into wh where it goes um, it, you know I just want to everybody to know this is a preliminary step and the board did not pass a tax today Okay, thank you, Jay, for that clarification. Okay. Moving on. Um, item number 13, approve and adopt an ordinance repealing Chapter 60, Title 7 of Delmark County Code relating to medical marijuana. 
and two, designate county council to prepare a sum summary of the ordinance for publication as requested by county council. Holy mackerel, where's Joel? Good morning, board. Good morning. Kind of cut it off every now and then. Right on. Um, this is the ordinance that we already introduced. It's just to uh, basically break some bad code out of our our ordinance. And uh, if there's any questions, I can answer them. Otherwise, I... Any Joel, questions? Yeah, Joel, I just want to... We had the conversation <clears throat> yesterday, the public note. There's nothing in this repeal code that's this, it's a non-substantive that's what you had mentioned to me i want everyone to know there's nothing it's an empty code that is correct okay S chair hemmingson i'd uh, make the motion to approve and adopt an ordinance repealing chapter 60 of title 7 of the delnor county code of regulations to medical marijuana and uh, designate county council to prepare the summary of the ordinance for publication a motion and a second any public comment Seeing no public comment, then we'll bring it back. Kylie, would you please pull the vote? Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. Okay, Joel, you're up again, I guess. Uh, same thing that we did last week, I guess. Huh? That we're, I mean, last meeting that we're finishing up. Uh, yes, sir. This is just another cleanup. These are um, some sections that got misnumbered, and we're fixing it. Great. administration citations and to designate county council to prepare a summary of the ordinance for publication as requested second I have a motion and a second any public comment seeing no public comment Kylie would you please pull the vote supervisor Howard yes supervisor Gitlin yes supervisor Berkowitz yes supervisor Cowan yes chair Hemmingson yes okay um, Item number 15, we're discuss, take possible action on using budgeted travel funds to send a supervisor to the NACO Western Interstate Region Conference being held in Mariposa County on May the 13th. Um, this was an item that, uh, that uh, Supervisor Howard um, had brought uh, to me about having interest in attending the WIR and then subsequently, subsequent to that, um, um, Supervisor Berkowitz sent me a, uh, an email requesting that he go to both NACO um, Ledge Conference uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as the WIR. Uh, and I had requested uh, last time this came up that he attend the WIR and not the um, uh, NACO uh, Legislative Conference. And he declined that uh, and didn't think that it was important. I personally think it's much more important uh, if we are going to be part of that, that we're part of the WIR. NACO is like being a teaspoon of krill in an ocean of whales. And, and so I, I'm not, uh, either one of them, I think uh, both RCRC and CSAC do a, a wonderful job in um, uh, bringing NACO uh, whether it's Western Interstate Region issues or NACO itself, I, I think they have a great relationship with both of them. So I, I'm going to put it up to the board on whether we think this is necessary and who it is that we want to send uh, in that direction. So uh, I will open Chairman, it up do for we discussion. Have a... I will open it up for discussion okay. in a minute. Uh, does anyone have anything they want to start with? Supervisor Berkowitz? Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to speak to item numbers. Uh, 15 and 16 as one item, if possible. Uh, for the last three years, I, along with the rest of the board, have attended both the annual CSAC and RCRC conference. All of us have come back after listening to the same information that was attended by all of us. I'd like to establish a more efficient way of getting information to the board and the public at minimum impact on our budget. First of all, I'd like to give up my participation to both CSAC and RCRC's annual conference and to substitute the NACO annual conference, which I've already attended for the last couple of years and give you, given you substantial reports, 
and also included, include in this the Western International Regional Conference that will be held in Mariposa County from May 13th through the 15th. Last year, Supervisor Hemmingson asked why was not attending the regional conference. And by substituting these two conferences, I'd be accomplishing Supervisor Hemmingson's objective. This way I'd bring the national perspective and regional information on national news or national issues as I have in the past. And in, as in the past, I'd also uh, pay for my wife's expenses so that she could record those sessions that I could not attend. Now there's one mistake in item 16. It refers to the request that I attend the national or NACO's legislative conference being held in Washington, <coughs> excuse me, in Washington, DC. It should read that I'd be attending the annual conference in July of this year in Wa Orange County, Washington. Again, I'd be willing to absorb any additional costs that are above my usual participation in both CSAC and RCRC so that we're better informed as a board and that we don't incur additional hit to our budget. So at this time, I'd like to move that our board adopt the foregoing recommendation. Supervisor Berkowitz, what, what can I ask one question? Um, you mentioned Orange County, Washington. Orange County, Florida. 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 And that's the, con the ledge that's coming up at the end of next month. No. Is not it. For oh, sure. listed is the one that's coming at the end of the month. Correct. The one in the email when this was being put together was the one in July. Okay. Right. And I'm not sure right. why this came up this way. I don't know either. Chair Hemmingson, are we Probably addressing just 15 at this point in time? Or I'm sorry? Are we addressing just, just 15? Just 15, yes. Yeah. This is, that's correct, yeah. Although uh, I think Supervisor Berkowitz made a motion without stating what it was. Right. The motion is that uh, I go to WIR and to the NACO annual conference and to delete my participation in CSAC uh, conference and um, RCRC so that there's no impact on the budget. Uh, Supervisor Berkowitz, it would be my honor to make that motion rather He's than you, you, you made yourself motion. Would you retract that and allow me to make that motion on your behalf and someone can second that? Yes. Okay, I'll make that motion uh, to send Supervisor Berkowitz to the Western Interstate Region Conference in uh, Mariposa County, California, May 13th to 15th. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any other motions? Yes, super, Supervisor, I did bring this to your attention. As, uh, as you're aware, as the board is aware, um, my involvement in CSAC this year has been stepped up quite dramatically, specific to the vice chair of the Natural Resources Committee and Agricultural Committee for CSAC. In working with Kevin Can over the years, which I've developed a great relationship with, I've spoken to him quite a bit about this upcoming conference, WIR conference in Mariposa County. And a lot of the items that are being presented this year are specifically those same items that we're gonna be addressing at the CSAC level. Kevin, um, having a very strong presence in WIR at both the state and national level now is suggested that we try to get as much attendance there as possible because of the networking opportunities that are going to be available to us. In addition, the workforce housing issues that have become pretty clear and present not only in the state of California are going to be addressed here along with the industrial hemp issue that this board is currently wrestling with along with the rural health care and community development type issues that we're dealing with. The most important piece that we're going to be addressing in CSAC and one that I'd benefit a great deal from in talking to fellow members with the WIR program is the resiliency and emergency preparedness type workshops is going to be specifically taking place at, at this <coughs> NACO WIR conference. Um, I'd, I'd love to have the support to attend the conference uh, if the board is so willing. Um, with Supervisor Berkowitz or without, depending on how, what the board direction is. But of course, there is a, a cost of doing so. Yes, okay. 
So you're making that motion? Yes, I'd make that motion. Can I get a second? I want to understand what we're doing here. So uh, are you asking, so if he's asking to go as well, are we talking and taking a vote to send two, to, two together? I, that's, we've that's. Got, we're, we're totally mud, muddying 15 and 16. You've, you know, Berkowitz already. 15 and 16 are two different. Right, two but Gitlin, in making his motion, brought them both together. No, I did not. No. I made 15 only. This is for the WIR. This is only okay, so for we, someone to go to the WIR, and I had no intentions of this being construed that we would be sending two people. Okay, and that's what was my question, okay, so one this, or two. This is, this is the difference between, uh, I think at this point, on sending uh, Berkowitz, send or, send, Berkowitz okay. or sending uh, Supervisor Howard. I will make a motion or second your motion of sending Supervisor Howard due to the fact of his position at uh, CSAC and what is being discussed at WIR. I think it goes hand in hand. I think we all know that. Um, so it makes most sense as far as representation for our county to have Supervisor Howard there. Yeah, and, and th that connection with Kevin Can, who also sits on RCRC, uh, he is the, the chairman of the WIR right now, and, and he is a very important component, and we have a great relationship, as Supervisor Howard and myself have a great relationship with him, and, and I, think, uh, uh, I think that's uh, imperative uh, that we continue that, um, to continue that relationship. So we will take the second motion first. Uh, is there any public comment? Seeing no public comment, Kylie, would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Gitlin? No. Supervisor Berkowitz? No. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. Okay, now we will take up um, item number 16, which is uh, sending a NACO representative uh, to, and now uh, I've been corrected, it's to uh, Orange County, uh, Florida. Correct, the annual conference. The annual conference, not the ledge conference, but the right. annual conference. And as I've stated before, I am not in favor of, uh, of having an independent uh, representative from this board uh, to go to NACO. I think we're lost in the shuffle. We are, you know, dust on the floor uh, when it gets to that level. So um, uh, I would entertain a uh, motion uh, to uh, send someone or not send someone or however we'd like to go there. I will make that motion to send Supervisor Berkowitz to the NACO Legislative Conference in Washington, uh, excuse me, in Orange County, Florida, February 29th to is that the correct date? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the correct uh, date. No, it's July. in July. July, July. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, in July of 2020. Okay. Okay, I have a motion. All right, I'll second that motion and add the addendum uh, that I would give up my uh, slot at CSAC in order to be able to afford uh, the annual conference and not have any impact on our budget that'll add to my motion that, that's acceptable okay any other further motions or discussion public comment seeing no public comment we'll bring it back to the board kylie would you pull the vote supervisor howard no supervisor cowan no supervisor berkowitz yes supervisor gitlin yes Chair Hemmingson. No. Okay, moving on to um, legislative issues, I think. Legislative and budget issues. Uh, Heidi, we have some rack stuff. Yes, uh, good morning, board. Uh, we were recently notified by the Six Rivers National Forest that uh, there will soon be a resource advisory committee, hopefully um, approved by the Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, uh, which will allow us then to compete for Title II funds. There are approximately $169,000 available. Uh, the County Roads Division has put together two applications, both for paving projects, 
on our forest roads. Uh, the first application was on low divide. It would be for paving uh, near Altaville Hill, which is on low divide road near Gasky Mountain. It's a steep area. Uh, the second location would be on Big Flat Road near its intersection with South Fork Road uh, in proximity to the Big Flat Road uh, campground. And uh, in my border part, I uh, described the, the width of the road, the length of the road, the depth of the paving service, et cetera. Um, in both cases, the county would be requesting uh, funds for the materials, and we would be providing the labor and the equipment as match. Uh, again, they'd be two separate applications. The first application would be requesting $78,200. Uh, with a $34,988 match for a combined project cost of $113,188. Uh, for the Big Flat Road project, we would be looking at uh, requesting $25,100 for the materials with a $17,025 match uh, for a combined project cost of $42,125. Great. Thank you, Heidi. These are two projects that I think we've been... Yep. Uh, have been put on the back burner for a long time and uh, uh, truly need to get accomplished. So I appreciate you bringing that forward to us. That goes without saying, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I would make the motion to um, approve the submission of the two project proposals to the Del Norte Resource Advisory Committee for Title II funds allocating from the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act, Determination Act for paving the low divide road and big flat road. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment? Seeing no public comment, then we'll bring it back. Kylie, would you please pull the vote? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. Okay. Is the sheriff still outside the door? Does he want to talk to this next item? I saw him out there just a minute ago. Oh, Chair? Yes. In the meantime, could we ask if there's any reportable actions from closed session? Did I not do that? Was there any reportable actions from closed session? No Council? reportable action. Thank you. Apologize for that. Sheriff, I, I wasn't sure whether you wanted to speak on uh, reactivating the uh, canine program, but I thought before we started discussing it that maybe you want, want to throw... Um, Sorry about that. There was a lot happening in the lobby. I'm sorry about that. It's probably my fault. <laughs> no problem. I, I gave out my personal phone number once again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a matter of public record. No big deal. So the uh, so the canine program. Um, just give me a second to collect my thoughts. The sheriff's office has had uh, canine policy on the books for a long time through our our. Uh, robust policy through Lexapol, uh, which as of January 1st is now online. Uh, anybody can find that. Um, there's a lot of benefits to a canine program. When I was at the police department, once again, I, I, I did not operate a canine, but I managed a canine program. So I have a, a little bit of knowledge on the subject. Um, it is great for staff because it provides lateral movement outside of promotional movement so it brings more depth and more opportunity to the staff uh, more importantly it provides a higher level of service to our community um, canines can be used and i don't have to tell you this i'm sure but canines can be used for detection protection uh, cadaver dogs uh, bomb sniffing dogs uh, one interesting focus that i think will make the sheriff's office canine program a, a little unique and I'd like to give credit to CDCR and Pelican Bay. Uh, they recently instituted a very successful canine program. As many of you know, the laws as it relates to um, controlled substances have sort of softened over the years, but it's not the case in a correctional facility. When people come into the Del Norte County Jail, uh, we're responsible for their well being. Uh, as we would really that of a child, um, I want to, and I think this makes our canine program unique, is I want multiple canines and I want one of them assigned to a correctional officer in the Del Norte County Jail. 
Uh, I've heard rumblings over the years that there's issues with sub substances in there, controlled substance drugs, and I would like to build a program that is so stout that we not only have canines assigned to operations, but also assigned to our correctional division. I think uh, that fixes that problem pretty quick. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So Mr. Chairman, to clarify that this does not come out of our general fund and this would be a completely separate fund to set up for the Sheriff's Department canines where he'd collect donations and various other pieces to help fund the program? Yes, he's nodding his head. Okay, very good. Then I, mean, yes. I would make the yeah. motion then to approve the reactivation of the Sheriff's Canine Program budget. Second. Awesome. I have a motion and a second. Can I just ask a quick question? It's moving quickly. Did, Sheriff, did you have a cost associated with this separate fund That's that you could share with us? $7,500. My intention is to be as successful as I possibly can raising funds. Uh, the more funds I generate, the more dogs I can get, the more mm -hmm. cops I can get trained, and the more equipment that I can purchase. Uh, canine programs are not inexpensive. Uh, you know, as we move forward and start looking at fundraising opportunities, I think it's my goal to hit somewhere somewhere north of 60,000. I'd like to get three canines. Uh, dogs can range around the $10,000 a dog price. You can nearly double that for the training and equipment associated. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions for the sheriff while he's here? Okay. Uh, chair, J chair, yes. just one Thanks, comment, sir. and I think the sheriff's aware of this, but there's some aspects of the MOU that address the employees that will uh, be involved in the program sure. that we're going to have to address through council and as we go through this, as well as SEA. Sure. I think they're more than fixable in any of the changes, but we just need to make them consistent with the, what the program is proposed and will be. Sure. That's a great point. I appreciate you bringing it up. It's something we definitely have to dust off. It's, it's been years since we've had a, uh, uh, what I would measure as a, as a successful canine program. Cool. Yeah. Thank you both. Kylie, would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. Okay, moving on to our last item. I guess, if I, did I skip anything else, Kylie, before I move on? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Um, approve and authorize the chair to send letters supporting the Transportation Emergency Relief Funds Available Availability Act, uh, H.R. 3193. Jay, anything you want to say about it? Sounds like a reasonable thing to me nothing really else to add to it at this point unless there's questions got to get a motion okay. Jay, ask a question mr sure Chairman. absolutely jay this is not the same um pot of funding that comes down from the fed specifically to keep last chance grade in place is it uh no i don't believe so um because it's also dubbed emergency it, it's emergency relief in the title so, I, but I don't believe that's the same okay. program. Same okay, very good. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve and authorize the chair to sign and send letters supporting the Transportation Emergency Relief Funds Availability Act, H.R. 3193. Introduced by Representative Gara Mendi and co-sponsored by 46 representatives as requested from the CAO. I have a motion. Do I have a second? A second, I have a motion. I have a motion and a second. Any public comment? Seeing no public comment, then we'll bring it back to the board. Kylie, would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Cowan? Yes. Chair Hemmingson? Yes. And with that, um, our next meeting is February 11th, and we are adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your participation.